Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. What happens in health care is we have general practitioners and then we have specialists. And specialists are special because when you need, you know, when you need something, you know, like you've fallen and, you know, you've fallen and you can't get up kind of thing, you better have an orthopedic surgeon in case you find out that you've had a, well, it doesn't even have to be broken, fractured, whatever you have. And so we always look for excellent orthopedic surgeons because um, it seems like more people as they age fall. And I'm going to be talking to Dr. Jason Walters who is an MD and he is there at Broward, uh, Broward Health. He performs his surgeries there. Uh, they have, of course, so many wonderful hospitals. But Dr. Walters, when we, when we start talking about people falling and, you know, and, and injuring themselves, it's not always necessary for an orthopedic surgeon, right? I mean, other kind of people can help them unless there's a break or a or, what, what would you define? It's not sprains. Sure. So it's actually first fractures. Anita, thank, you, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, when we talk about slips and falls, this is very uh, dangerous, especially when we're talking about an elderly population because, as most people know, when you get older, your bones get a little bit softer, a little bit frailer, and you can have uh, pretty severe breaks or fractures from simple ground-level falls. So, uh, you know, the main thing is you know, listen to your body. So if you fall on an outstretched wrist or fall directly onto your elbow or hip or knee, you know, how much pain are you having, right? Are you able to put pressure on it right away? Um, are, is there a lot of swelling? If you have significant pain, swelling, or inability to move or put weight on that extremity, uh, you probably uh, are going to come under the services of an orthopedic surgeon. But it's one of those things as to whether how much you can tolerate it. So if I fall on an outstretched wrist, if I can't, uh, if the pain is so severe that I'm not able to function, really need to go to an emergency room. And um, an emergency room physician can make the initial diagnosis of a fracture versus a sprain. And that sort of will help us uh, triage things, right? So that will uh, allow us to figure out whether it's an urgency, emergency, or something that can be uh, followed up uh, in the office later. Um, so that's probably step one. Uh, step two will then be determined upon the findings uh, with the physician in the emergency room, and they uh, will then refer you either to an orthopedic surgeon at that time, or uh, and the surgeon will come in to see you, or they will refer you to an outpatient. And that's generally speaking how it, the way it should work and really does work. Well, it's interesting as we're talking, and hadn't really planned on saying this, but I have a, a dog sitter who was on her bicycle and she fell. It's up in Palm Beach County. And the first thing that happened, of course, uh, she, she started calling, said, help, I need help. And sure. she did uh, dislocate her elbow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but the interesting thing is when they took her to an emergency, you know, the emergency at the hospital, but they didn't check her because I guess she, you know, when you're in trauma, they didn't, for some reason, while she was there, didn't check her ankle. Mm. It turns out that now she has a frank, she had a frank sh fracture on her ankle. So here she has you know, a boot on her ankle, and then she has a sling, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting uh, thing now that they they make. We don't do the, the we don't do those casts that we used to have anymore. That's very nice. So you're very right that she did not know she did all these things, yeah. and um, and as a and they did bring in an orthopedic surgeon who just happened to be luckily was there, and then started taking care of it. So the reason I mention this is because. People um, have to start watching where they walk. They have to, when they do ride bikes, when they, I watch people ride motorcycles, I gasp at what they're doing because it's a long healing. This is not casual. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and what happens, you know, as a, as a um, let's say, as a mom or, or somebody who's got to take care of other people, it does take the whole family. That's it is, does take a village, doesn't it? That's absolutely correct. It's not correct. simple. So it's simple things such as shoe wear, also placemats. So, you know, or floor rug or area rugs that you have in your home, 
those can be very dangerous um, if they're not in a proper place. And I've seen a lot of uh, slips and falls simple from that. Or someone just not paying attention and said, oh, I didn't throw on my shoes. I just had some slocks on and I slipped and fell. And next thing you know, they're in my office. So these are just sort of day-to-day, everyday things. But, you know, we are humans. We make mistakes. But that's why you have orthopedic surgeons to take care of those problems when they do occur. Well, I was thinking mm-hmm. about now that I have I've watched her boot, first it went from a large one to a smaller one. Um, so, somebody really... Uh, must have made a lot of money figuring out how to do this compared to, remember, it used to be casts. Well, casts still have their roles and still have their place. Um, and there are some fractures that you want to hold into a certain place that don't necessarily need surgery that you still want to use casts for. But with that said, uh, removable braces and removable boots definitely have an increasing role in orthopedic surgery. And they're, like you said, uh, I wish I was smart enough to think of that maybe 15, 20 years ago because there was a lot of money to be made off of those. And those are definitely being used at increased frequency. Now, as an orthopedic surgeon, do you specialize in anything, uh, neck, hands, arms, legs, knees? Sure. So um, I practice, so I did specialty training uh, after my general orthopedic residency in uh, sports medicine, and that provided me uh, to do uh, surgeries, soft tissues. So orthopedic surgery is uh, surgery of the bone and joints, but it also includes musculoskeletal injuries. And uh, my sports medicine training uh, taught me how to deal with soft tissues, such as ligament injuries, tendon injuries, that sort of thing specifically. There was other training in, involved in that, but it honed me in to do those sorts of training. My practice primarily is uh, general orthopedics with a subspecialty in uh, sports medicine. So I see uh, a lot of patients, like you described, that slip and fall, break their hip, break their ankle, break their wrist, and I treat those patients. But specifically, sort of my niche uh, and specialty in practice is sports medicine. So I have people that tear their rotator cuff or I'll have young patients that uh, tear their anterior cruciate ligament or uh, meniscus or knee, or just have knee ligament injuries. I'll treat those as well, as well as injuries about the elbow and ankle. And so um, as you're treating these types of injuries, um, do people get depressed as they're, they're, I mean, I've noticed that that they they carry on. It's a terrible thing because they have like something extra on their arm or their legs. Do you notice that? Do you do anything about that? So there's definitely a mental side to any time you sustain an injury. And there's always a mental component, I believe, in your wellness. So uh, do I, uh, I wouldn't say I diagnose people with clinical depression, but people do get down in terms of their spirits. But, you know, what I will say is, I kind of stick to the facts and I show them their x-rays before and after and I show them how and I remind them how they initially presented to me either with a big limp or unable to walk or ain't able to elevate their arm and I show them what they're able to do now and that usually uh, motivates people and encourages them. The one thing I will say what drew me to orthopedics is the patient population. Generally speaking, patients are motivated to get better. They come to you for a reason. So they typically are motivated to get back to walking, to getting back to doing the activities that they want to do. Oh, you're so right, because there are, (laughs) that's right, there are other fields of medicine which are not the same. Uh, My husband had, over a period of many years, he had two knees both replaced, and he had four hips, not all at the same time. Okay. But And then uh, he lived to be 93, and he walked and did everything. He didn't now push himself playing golf or tennis because they said you want to come back just start doing it so he didn't do that <laughs> but he survived and and he was like 20 years with his knees and that was a long time for because i'm sure they're much better now so um what i generally tell people is so survivorship of uh orthopedic implants is something that we are constantly monitoring and it's constantly discussed at uh, meetings around the country um we like to think that the latest and greatest technology is always the best, but believe it or not, that's not always the case. Some of the hip implants that were being put in in the 1960s and 1970s still are surviving, and that's 40, 50 years later. And we've always tried to advance, but sometimes we've had some step backs, and sometimes we've had some advancements going forward. In the 90s, we didn't have the best plastics because generally speaking, um, it's a metal or, or ceramic, or, or cer- it's a metal. Right. It's a combination, actually, and it's a, usually a metal or ceramic on a piece of plastic. And the plastics we were making in the '90s and early aughts weren't 
as aren't as good mm-hmm. as the ones that we have now. We have harder plastics that don't cause bone loss or erosion and require multiple surgeries. So when we look at the survivorships, like of knees, it's usually 85% at 15 years and declines by 5% mm-hmm. thereafter. So we do like to think that we are always advancing, but believe it or not, there is a gold standard, and that was pretty much set in the 1960s that we're always trying to be. Right. And, yeah. and my guest, I just want everyone to know, is Dr. Jason Walters, and he is um, a, a, an orthopedic surgeon practicing at Broward Health North, Broward Health Imperial Point, and anywhere that they need him, of course. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, Dr. Walters, and you did mention this about sports, and and now we all know what's going on with football players and kids playing these sports. Um, I don't know if you have children and how you yes, you do. do and how mm-hmm. you feel about that. Well, um, they have better. Wait, I did hear a whole, <laughs> see a whole article that the helmets are better. That that everyone's trying to do a better job so that kids can still play, but that they're safer. Well, is that I, true? Um, well, I'll just say I'll I'll back up a step and say that you know football specifically, American football is an inherently violent sport. Okay, uh, the part of the game is to take down uh, an, uh, a a player, so via tackling, and that's you can't do that in a safe manner. Um, as far as head injuries are concerned, there always are going to be part of the game. The purpose of the helmet is not to prevent concussions. The purpose of the helmet was designed because they had leather helmets before, and people were getting uh, skull fractures. So the original design for helmets was to prevent skull fractures, and it was successful at doing that. It's just that now people are trying to apply that technology and prevent uh, concussions, but you have a skull and your brain is shifting during collisions, and no helmet is really going to prevent your brain from shifting. So I don't think it's really right to think that helmet technology will prevent concussions. I think that if you're going to play football, you have to kind of accept that there are going to be head injuries. I do agree that there are techniques that uh, can be implored, such as head up, uh, to do tackling that will prevent uh, head injuries and neck injuries. But the nature of the game is uh, violent, and you're going to have injuries there. Now, um, there are things that we can do to prevent other injuries, such as shoulder injuries, which is why we have pads and knee injuries, and we can sort of teach people how to fall. But the nature of the game is is a violent game and yeah, it's, the it's way gonna you put that that's yeah that's really true so so let's let me ask you this uh do many of your surgeries come from tennis or from other kinds of sports well um so just generally speaking i treat all patients okay so i treat uh, patients from high school age uh, all the way up so uh i run the gamut in terms of weekend warriors Uh, high professional elite athletes to just regular everyday people and people injure themselves just doing anything simply walking across the street going to the bathroom or on the football field tennis court or even on the golf course so um where do I get the overwhelming majority of my injuries it's going to be from slips and falls as you uh, said at the beginning um and also you know athletes who injure themselves on the field so we get it all across the board (laughs) right and and of course uh and, and I was I always ask why did you become a the specialization and you already told us that so I won't do that but um, when you first start now you haven't been practicing that long I've been in practice for about six years okay mm-hmm. but I've talked to people who are practicing thirty years <laughs> sure sure and I always ask them so when you first started practicing what were the skills what were the techniques what what were the appliances compared to today so I don't know in your short time have you seen a difference I have actually. Um, so some of the, well, first off, one of my mentors told me when we were, you know, surgery is an apprenticeship, right? So you're learning, um, how to do procedures, but you're also learning how to carry yourself and how to act and how to continually educate yourself. And that's probably one of the things that my mentors taught me initially. He said that he, he had been in practice for about 20, 30 years. And he said, the surgeries that I'm doing today are nothing like I learned when I was in residency. Everything has completely changed and completely evolved. Um, so I went through uh, stages in practice 
with that knowledge, and believe it or not, I have seen changes <laughs> in the short amount of time that I've been in practice. So I've been in practice for six years, but prior to that, I was in residency and training for six plus years. So I could say over the past 10 years, I have seen uh, changes in technique. One example would be like a hip replacement. So initially when I was in training, everyone did everything from a posterior approach and slowly over t- and the overall majority of surgeons still do it that way. But things have now switched to an anterior approach from uh, especially down here in South Florida. One of the other things is robotic surgery. When I first started, uh, there was absolutely no robotic surgery. A lot of surgeons felt that it would slow them down and uh, it would just change things at the margins and slowly over time, uh, robots are assisting surgeons more and more. Right, and I, I very, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very excited about what's happening. I don't know whether it's stem cells or whatever. That some people are just not having surgery; they're yeah. doing different kinds of things. And what about that? So, biologics in orthopedic surgery is the new frontier. I almost I, when I when patients ask me about it, I often describe it as the wild wild west, <laughs> because there's a lot of good, mm-hmm. there's a lot of gold, and there is a lot of fool's gold as well. So you have to be very careful with the biologics. Um, we have a lot of good evidence to support biologics for certain use, and then uh, what people try to do is. Uh, use those for different indications that it isn't always the proof for, so you have to be very careful. I say all that to say that biologics have a certain role in treating certain uh, injuries, and they certainly can be successful. Um, now, the re- another reason why I call it the wild, wild west is because it's still considered experimental. So a lot of insurances do not pay for it. Uh, so it's usually cash pay, and you know, you have to be, for me, I'm very careful, especially when people are spending their hard earned money on what to recommend it for. So we just recommend, I recommended it, I, excuse me, I recommend it just for uh, things that I think it has a good track record for and there's good evidence to support its use. And so would I call you a hospitalist or you have your own practice in addition? Uh, so I'm employed by the district, or Broward Health. Um, my office is across the street from Broward General. Um, I'm not always in the hospital, so I don't consider myself a hospitalist, but uh, a lot of my surgeries are done in the hospital, and my office is outside of the walls of the hospital. So uh, in theory, I'm in private practice, but I'm part of the a group of physicians that are employed by Broward Health. Yes, because they have to make sure they have enough doctors <laughs> that do this, don't they? Exactly. Um, well, but talking about this, let's men and women how are their bones different i mean when you're i mean i know they're different but do you treat them differently in your surgeries um so usually generally speaking no now that depends on what procedure i'm doing so uh, the overwhelming majority of the axial skeleton is actually the same from men to women obviously varying sizes women just tend to be a little bit smaller than men um the pelvis is different the pelvis obviously is a different is different it's, it's going to be have a wider canal to accommodate uh, birth but in terms of the specific procedures that I do it's going to be tailored individually to the patient uh, not necessarily man or woman the one thing I do have to worry about a little bit more with older women is osteoporosis uh, because that's extremely common once we get above the age of 55 60 and sometimes depending upon if I'm treating a broken bone or we're doing uh, uh, a type of replacement, we may have to use a little bit stronger fixation because of the softer bone. But in terms of gender-specific uh, surgery, believe it or not, for me, I, I don't find that there's any specific things that I need to do for men versus women. Okay, and before, I don't want to finish. Um, it's so interesting <laughs> to have you here, but I want to talk about rehab. Sure. Because I know for you as a orthopedic surgeon, you've done everything you can do, and now you send them to the rehab center, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I often tell patients, especially when we're doing elective surgery, I tell you, I can do a perfect surgery, but if the rehab is not followed through, you're going to get a poor result. And I think the opposite is true too. You can have a marginal surgery done, but if you have excellent rehab done afterwards, um, you can have an excellent result. Now, I will tell you, the, the majority of advancements in the majority of surgeries that I do has not been, the advancements in the last five, 10 years has not been on the surgical side. The surgical techniques, um, while we can get 
faster and more efficient and have better implants. But how patients get better and return to what they want to do faster is through rehab. Rehab is where all the advances uh, are really taking place that allow patients to come back stronger and faster, in my opinion. So rehab for any orthopedic procedure is critical (laughs) and is probably going to be the determining factor uh, on how you perform, given that the majority of surgeries are done well. So why don't you go into that a little bit more? So now you as the surgeon, you have put the bones back or you've yes. done things. Now what what are you expecting the rehab to do? So when we're treating fractures or let's say a, a rotator cuff injury, what we, when at surgery, what we do is we restore the normal anatomy, okay? And we do that uh, in a manner that allows for early motion. So what we worry about as orthopedic surgeons, number one is stiffness in the immediate post-operative phase. So what therapy is designed to do is depending upon what you had done and how far out from the date of surgery you are, will allow you to move your joint in a safe manner that will not disturb uh, the surgery that you had. Um, And then it's a matter of how stable the fixation we have and how quickly we can move uh, in terms of range of motion and also strengthening. So it's just about how aggressive we can be. And believe it or not, we can't just have a cookie cutter uh, rehab protocols. Each of these rehab protocols needs to be tailored specifically to the patient based on one, their bone quality, their tissue quality, one, how well fixation we had at surgery and also their preoperative status, right? So a lot of uh, the predictors for how you do with rehab determines on how well you did after surgery. So, you know, we see all these professional athletes coming back sooner. Mm -hmm. The reason they're able to do that is one, they were really strong, really fast before surgery. Number two, unlike you and me, they get paid to rehab. So instead of uh, having to pay for rehab twice a week, they get paid to rehab every day. So they kind of have the best of the best, right? As they should. But for us and what we're able to determine from them is that their preoperative status will determine their postoperative status so and it's the same for most everyday people ah that's a very good point <laughs> i haven't heard that said that way but uh and, and then to uh, so someone should pay you to go to rehab right every day. <laughs> but but the other thing is uh the pain it takes for rehab now sometimes people can stand because it's not easy, is it? When when you've just had an operation, now you're pushing, aren't you? Yeah, so a lot of the hesitation that most people have in going with through with surgery is the pain associated with surgery and the pain associated with rehab. What I'll say is I, I work uh, very diligently with uh, my anesthesia partners mm-hmm. and uh, practitioners, and we try to have a multi-modal uh, approach to control patients' pain. So we try to control their pain before surgery even starts, during the surgery, and after the surgery. And once people are able to realize that they can move after surgery and it doesn't hurt as much, that's how they're able to fly through with rehab. There are some patients whose pain is not controlled initially, and I see them go a little bit slower with rehab. So pain control is important for that. It's very important and critical in outcomes. And and really, I, I remember when my husband was going through the rehab that some he knew to do this but sometimes they forgot to tell him take pain pills before you go oh yeah i tell i tell all my patients that whether it's papa ibuprofen before you go to therapy but that just helps you do more with therapy and encouraging that uh progresses that improves your uh outcome and progression and the other part of that i know so much about and it was very hard being revisited revisions and I'm sure you don't like revisions because they're tough, aren't they? No, revisions aren't always uh, the most fun surgery, but they certainly can be the most rewarding. So you have someone uh, who may have worn out a knee replacement or a hip replacement or um, may have worn out a previous surgery that they had and are coming to you um, with an obvious problem. Um, revisions uh, in sports medicine can be extremely tough because uh, you only have so much tendons to work with But uh, again, they can be the most, some of the most rewarding cases, but they certainly are the most challenging. Those are either um, 
from patients that may have slipped and fallen in, in, the, in their post-operative phase, or uh, God forbid, if uh, a surgeon, uh, need, had, they had surgery by a surgeon and that wasn't the best job, wasn't done, and it needs to kind of be redone. So you have to pull uh, everything out in a way, don't you, that was done? Is that the, why it's such, so difficult? Well, uh, treatment really needs to be tailored based on the individual. So sometimes, yes, you have to uh, destroy everything, take everything out, and then reconstruct it re- be, and build it back up. Uh, sometimes you're able to work around and work with some of the uh, findings that are there. And sometimes, um, and this happens more than not, you know, someone did a really good job, but someone slipped and fell, and they may have had a fracture or an injury adjacent to where they had previous surgery, and you have to sort of work around the, the previous work that was done. So I'm going to uh, tell you, so so if you have a bunch of students who are in, um, thinking about becoming physicians, Tell me what you would say to them about becoming an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> well, um, I will tell them orthopedic surgery is probably one of the most competitive uh, subspecialties in medical school because it's very rewarding. Again, the patient population is one that's completely motivated to get better. Um, and that can be very rewarding. But, you know, I think if you go into medicine these days, uh, for finances, that's probably not the smartest thing. If you want to get rich, go into finance or business. <laughs> but if you want to go to help people, yeah. see people get better, orthopedic surgery is probably the one of the best fields in medicine. I mean, I can't tell you how much pride it put, p- p- brings to me when I have somebody that comes to my office that literally can't lift their arm up above their shoulder because they have a, a tear in their rotator cuff. And then you, you explain to them exactly what's going on. You diagnose the problem and you take them to surgery. And six months later, they can bring their arm up above their arm. The amount of pain that they were having is no longer there. I mean, if you go into medicine for that, then, you know, orthopedic surgery would be an excellent field to go into. Well, it's been a wonderful uh, conversation, Dr. Jason Walters with Broward Health. Thank you so much. I learned a lot, and I, I love your enthusiasm and your, your smile, and so I'm sure all your patients feel really good after you work with them. I hope so. Thank you. I appreciate it.